Honestly, I I don't know if I've just touched hearts. Uh, when I think back and reflect on what uh, my best critic tells me, which is my wife, <laughs> I probably spent the first several years of my life, professional life, touching minds and not hearts. A very left-brained approach to communication. If you tell people things logically, they will respond. Uh, it's only in the latter part of my career. 20 years and i have to give the credit or the lack of it to my wife saying that you move people by touching hearts you can convince people by touching heads but uh, if you want to really get people moving in a convinced way you have to do both and i try consciously to weave anecdotes and stories around uh, the kernel of a fact rather than just throw facts I used to come from the although it was the pre-PowerPoint era when I was younger, uh, but it was a very PowerPoint mentality. Assemble the facts, put them into nice charts, uh, explain the charts. And at one such presentation, I remember somewhere in the late 70s, I made at Hyderabad. My wife happened to be present, and I thought I'd made a terrific speech because I'd done a lot of research and. I was throwing all the growth rates and numbers, and she came back and said, "I didn't understand a word of what you're talking about." And of course, the first reaction is to say that's because you haven't studied all these wonderful things that I've studied. And then it struck me that you know she's a smart person, she's also educated, and if she, even if she is slightly exaggerated, if she can't comprehend it, then what is all the research in the numbers worth? And I asked her how would I have done it differently, and then I started my journey of education that you have to learn. to touch hearts and not just minds and i think i probably spent the next 10 15 years mutating in a conscious sort of way to a different way of communicating compared to before so when you said is there an episode that's what that is. we all live in multiple worlds uh, whether you call them what i have called it or you can give other names to it there is the ekanta world when you are all by yourself and i call that the inner world when the ghosts that torment you the ego that boosts you the doubts that assail you the convictions that assure you all come together in a medley of music in your mind and make you who you are uh, howsoever confident a person may look that person is no less prone to self doubt um, and ghosts as any other person that's what i call the inner world the second is the world of relationships nobody can get anything done all by himself or herself so whether it's spouse family or colleagues or strangers or government officer or even a shooting of a film i'm dependent on all of you to make me look good <laughs> right irrespective of who i am so that's the world of relationship when you can people want to react interact with and then you come into the last world the last not the last world the the outer world which is the world of actually getting things done just by persuading you moving you nothing gets done you actually have to engage in the act of operating uh, the factory or the marketing system or whatever so these three worlds fit in very naturally into the professional world of a manager but they equally naturally fit into the personal world of a mother or a father or a son or a uh, anybody else even in the world of uh, spirituality when you are alone with your god um, then you come into the next world and the outer world is the world of the rituals and the temples and so on and people can so this three world model um, is a very practical elegant way to establish how we live in the world with ourselves with other people and doing things self awareness is a component of leadership because leadership requires a followership there's no point being a leader when nobody is following you and the connection between the leader and the follower happens through wave signals words writing acting whatever um thoughts all of these are ways of connecting people uh you have an effect on the other person of persuasion conviction lack of belief whatever uh so you are doing something something happens to the other person and after the communication wire is cut there is what i called a wake now the word wake i have taken from shipping when a ship moves through the ocean or through a river the engine of the ship is running it hits the water and makes the ship move but after the ship is moved away if you look at the rear part of the ship they are called a wake the effect it has had on the water ship has moved 
but the effect that it has on the water creates a lot of turbulence or it creates a neat path does it create undercurrents all sorts of things can happen and to a good shippy looking at the wake of a ship is a very important signal of stability of uh, transmission of forces in a constructive way etc so i believe that even with leadership the leader does his thing the follower does his thing but when the transaction is completed there is a wake in what condition is the follower left uh, very often it lasts for a day and then is forgotten you go and see some famous man and one one day later it's forgotten so self awareness is being aware that you leave a wake as a leader and to reflect on whether that is the wake you wanted to leave that's the point i wanted to make therefore self awareness is one of the component of leadership see i i don't personally like to use the word spirituality not because i believe in it or don't believe in it, but it is the most misunderstood word in the world and uh, by using the word in the way i think it means the other person may understand it differently if i use the same word i prefer to use the word ethicality because that is not capable of being misunderstood ethicality has overtones of uh, doing the right thing right conduct right words right transaction whatever right might mean <laughs> without any reference to religiosity or believing in god atheism it doesn't touch any of those controversial areas and i think the essence of your question is not about uh, you may use the word spirituality or god to communicate a concept but it's about ethicality it's about doing the right things in the right time in the right way with the right people etc so i will if you don't mind use the word ethicality let the listener decide whether he or she wants to substitute it to the word spirituality You know uh, we're all born ethical and we die ethical what happens in between god alone knows okay uh, have you seen an unethical child probably not when somebody is on his last breath assuming that you had an experience does he look even even uh, even uh, robber barons and in, uh, in history and mythology have been good people when they were dying i have an employee who's working for me he or she fudges the expense state it comes to light instead of charging 100 rupees they put a little zero on the one it become 900 yeah, medical bills or transport bills is the act unethical yes is uh, it unacceptable yes but if she comes and tells you that you know i have got xyz situation in my home or my family does it change your opinion it influences your opinion it may or may not change it and i think the lenses start to click along and therefore one person may say give that person a warning another person may say no stop two increments a third person may say sack the person the facts are exactly the same so i think the principles of ethicality are determined by the way we sense the world and those senses come out of the way i'm using eyesight as a sense and to the best of my perception of ethicality yes i have brought i think everybody does nobody has consciously decided to be unethical ethicality is to do with the peace of your mind well you want to do the right things but what is the right thing if there are six people around the table who have slightly different versions they are not diametrically opposite but slightly different versions of what is the right thing then you have a debate around the board i give you this i gave you this example of this employee who put a zero around the one and so there can be three people six people two of them have this view to the other view to the other view all of them are ethical the one who argues that you must sack because there has to be a black and white otherwise they'll never be disciplined is not wrong huh? but uh, you the second person who says forgive and uh, stop two increments is not wrong and the person who says every great leader religious leader has always said to forgive is divine so forgive the person is also not wrong so you get a certain quality of discussion and debate around it which is a joint pursuit of what is ethical nobody defines it that way you're trying to solve the problem of what to do with this particular infarction i'll give you one more example because the examples make it real you know i when i was in the middle east i used to come for some interviews to recruit people in those days 20 years ago it is a very prized job to go to dubai or muscat or something there was a person who met the headhunter at short list to come at 11 o'clock he didn't turn up i was a bit uh, upset 
there's a schedule that you're following. Anyway, I said, scratch his name out. At four o'clock, a person turned up with his tie knot completely open. His jacket was all over the place. His hair was, and he was carrying some funny box of sweets in his hand. And he said, I am the person who was supposed to come at 11. I've come now. I'm sorry about it for the delay, five hours. He says, can you interview me? So I said, nothing doing. We're not interviewing a guy who can't even turn up on time. He said, okay, sir, it doesn't matter if you can't interview me, but will you have a suite? So I said, this is a very funny experience. Why should I have a suite from you? Who are you? You're just another CV to me. He said, no, I want to tell you why I got delayed. I said, okay. He says, my wife and I were planning to have a family and uh, it's quite a long time now, nine, ten years. And then she became pregnant and she's due any moment. This morning I dressed up nicely. I wore my tie and combed my hair and I went to get into the bus to come here. I get a call saying she needs to move to the hospital. Sir, my priority was my wife's pregnancy. So I went back. I took her in a taxi and all that and attended to her. I'm very happy to tell you we've had a baby boy or baby girl. So please have a sweet. <laughs> now he's already touched you in a different place from here. And then uh, he says, I don't think I did the wrong thing. After 10 years, my wife is expecting. I think I did the right thing. If you can interview me, interview me. If you can't, I still got my baby boy at home. What do you think we did? We interviewed him. He's bloody good. We hired him. <laughs> it just changes if you see the context is different. So there is no single thing about punctuality. In this case, it's not ethicality, but punctuality. You just change if the context changes. So the same act can look very different in one situation as compared to another. And I think it complexifies what ethicality is in the boardroom or elsewhere in your personal life. And it's one of the greatest uh, teachers in life of uh, what is right, what is wrong. Bhishma was a great man in the Mahabharata. But he did not intervene when Draupadi was being disrobed. Was he a lesser man? Who is to judge that? Why did he not intervene? These questions remain unanswered. So, context matters. Context matters. What you have to do, you must do. So, I'll give you an example. We had an unfortunate fraud back in 2000. It is called Tata Finance. It's now a fairly famous case in loss of governance and control. We discovered, we appointed an external agency and an auditor to find out what went wrong. We brought it to the public domain by telling the regulators. And it is a very tough thing to do because effectively we were telling people something's hit us, we don't know what happened. Who wants to be admitting that he doesn't know what happened in his company? Um, a number of things happened around that, which is not the subject of my discussion. But uh, I was sitting on the left side of Mr. Tata at an annual general meeting of one of our companies and several elderly shareholders were criticizing, moaning, groaning that we held shares in this company and we will not get any dividend and not only that our capital has also gone. And to my great surprise, Mr. Tata stood up and made a statement. He said, I want to tell all my shareholders who are present here and not present here that none of you is going to lose money. And from one form or another, Tata's sons will make up the money. So please don't have that fear. Just give us a little time. Um, when he sat down, I said, you don't know how big the hole is. It could be 50 crores, it could be 100 crores, it could be 500 crores. Uh, you have made a public commitment and we are a company with a limited liability. Company secretaries understand what that means. So why did you take an unlimited liability? And his reply to me was, there are some times when you just have to do what's right. Later on, it turned out that the hole was 500 crores or 700 crores, which we filled up. If you can't do the right thing at the right time, later on trying to make up for it uh, doesn't make sense. And I've learned lessons like that. They've had an influence on me. You have to speak up, you have to speak up at the right time and find the right way to get your message across. That doesn't mean jumping up and, you know, beating your chest and in, in, indulging in theatrics. But it needs, what needs to be done must be done.